Hi folks, welcome to Just Off the Highway. A short while ago, I introduced a slight variation on the usual episodes, uh, an occasion where I get to chat to South Africans that I admire about people and places and stories that in some way connect personally to them. I called it Patkos because it's like that break in a journey where you get to take it easy, chat, maybe even have some refreshments before you go further. But some viewers were disappointed because they expected the main focus to be about the food and that wasn't the idea at all. So I decided I want to change the name. The problem is I don't really have a name. I've tried uh, Detour, I've tried uh, Pit Stop, I've tried Sidetracked. Mm, they just don't fit. So I'm asking you, if you have an idea for these slightly longer form kind of interview based episodes, please put your suggestion for a name in the comment section. And if you're the one person whose suggestion I really like, I'll be happy to send you a limited edition Just Off The Highway t-shirt. So folks, I welcome your suggestions and I look forward to hearing from you. I've got a really special guest for you today and uh, she's over there just pretending to ring the doorbell. So let's go and say hi. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> Life is fun. <laughs> and we'll... I'm a, I'm a clapper board. To be doing this again. <laughs> Seems to, be, seems to be the way we start every episode. <laughs> okay. So if you ever are stuck at the side of the road and uh, for some reason you need help, uh, my guest will arrive in a helicopter. She will fix the problem with your car. While she's doing that, she will actually landscape the environment around you and then interview you at the same time. So welcome, Melanie Walker. Thank you very much, Ali. And yeah, I really do wish I still had a helicopter because driving in Johannesburg at the moment is just a nightmare. <laughs> well, helicopters are kind of weird. Anybody who's ever spent any time around them, mm. and just to uh, introduce your time in a helicopter uh, to the viewers, because Melanie has reached the point where she's kind of iconic. Apparently. You, 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 you've reached the status of being an icon, and an icon who is intimately associated with adventure and with unbelievably daring stunts. How many of those stunts on that helicopter were actually real? Well, they were all real. Of course, they had, we couldn't. We were running. We didn't have a way of setting it up and faking it. So safety standards in the <laughs> what safety standards? This is not England. It's not in any state. We did whatever we wanted to do, which is <laughs> quite crazy. I mean, I think the worst one was um, up in Pilgrim's uh, past Pilgrim's Rest at the Finger of God. What is it called? The Pinnacle. Right. Where I had to stand on the ground. They brought the helicopter up above me, and then I had to hold on with these little hands to the skids and then he took me over a thousand foot drop to land on the top of the pinnacle. And this is the point where like, there were no even, safety chains. Even Vietnam veterans are going, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going whoa as well. I was like trying to pull the helicopter down to come and get me. But yeah, I have a it's a weird thing because I have a, a fear of heights. <laughs> okay, that's, that's great career choice at that point. Yeah, so I mean, as long as I was holding on to something, I was fine, which is why I've never jumped out of an aeroplane, okay, because everybody was going, come and jump with us. And I'm like, no, everybody has to have one thing that they absolutely will not do, that is mine. If you've spent any time around helicopters, mm -hmm. they, they become a kind of magical thing. You never forget them. Mm -mm. They, have, they have got a, a weird hold over People. I love helicopters. When oh. you can hear engine, in fact, you can hear a helicopter before you hear it. It's like your skin yeah. starts to tingle. Have you ever had that? Every single day. Every, if there's a helicopter flying anywhere, I'm like, where is it? Where is it? Come and fetch me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get over it. I really, yeah. that's the one thing I do miss the most about doing that show. But what's interesting, by the way, I read something recently that they're thinking of doing Treasure Hunt in England again and bringing Annika Rice back which I think would be fantastic. So I have now spoken to the ex-producers on Treasure Hunt and said, maybe our time is now. To do, to do, to do a reboot. I still have the outfit and I still fit into it. 
<laughs> <laughs> this is going to be one of those episodes because Melanie Walker is a force of nature. Melanie Walker is someone who has boundless energy and does the most amazing adventurous things. Mm. And what are you doing now? Because you, we started off talking about helicopter stunts mm. in your days as a presenter and an adventurer on a program called Treasure Hunt. Yes. But you've done many things since then. You've oh, yeah. Motor racing, journalism, writing books, broadcasting, podcast, radio. What are you mostly doing these days? Mostly at the moment, uh, gardening, but I don't actually garden. I teach people how to garden. So I work for um, Hideko Bulbs, which is really great because they are such an innovative company and probably the biggest bulb company, not just here in South Africa, but worldwide as well. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. I have a lot of fun um, shooting little videos, little TikTok things with my kids. And my one daughter's also now studying to be a landscaper and horticulturalist. So we have a lot of fun and I'm teaching her and I teach people and I run the social media side of things. So that side keeps me quite busy. I really enjoy it. Um, and then I teach Pilates because I damage my back. Nothing to do with treasure hunt or racing cars. <laughs> Falling over and winning Miss Hillbrow is when I hurt my back. <laughs> well, Hillbrow's <laughs> always been a dangerous place. Yeah, but it wasn't dangerous in those days. It was only dangerous if I was wearing a costume, a tiara, a sash and high heels. And somebody put any champagne near me. So yeah, and I took my back out quite badly and then realized many, many years later that Pilates fixes you. It is the most incredible thing. So now I spend a lot of time rehabilitating people who've got problems with their body. So you believe in your Greek friend Pilates? Joseph Pilates, yes. He's, okay. I mean, except they're trying to convince us that, oh, well, he did, but they, oh, there's film footage of him doing jumping jacks. I'm like, uh, ain't nobody got time for jumping jacks. I don't do them. Okay. <laughs> now, speaking of time, you were mentioning gardening, yep. which, you see, I just can't see it. With your kind of energy, I can see you looking at a plant and going hurry up yeah you know straighten up where's your posture yeah. <laughs> that does happen and i've had to really scale back and i think from having kids it made you made me realize that a lot of the time i just have to take a deep breath i had to get rid of all my motorbikes because i suddenly thought what happens if somebody takes me out on mm -hmm. a motorbike because I mean that's you're just a, basically a meat carcass waiting for something to clap a you. Donor, yeah. At least in a car you've got some kind of protection around you but with the, the whole thing of like going I have to keep calm I have to be patient because I'm growing children and all of a sudden I could grow stuff and that is one thing I find with a lot of people is like they I planted these these bulbs three months uh, three weeks ago and they're not growing I'm like yeah because that's how bulbs work <laughs> so this is my thing when people are, I want this and I'm like you can't have it and they go why I say because it's the wrong season so you have to wait and it is an exercise in patience and the sort of art of surrender yeah you have to at the same time. I suppose it's in like certain th other things in life um, you know talking about various like even with martial arts sometimes you have to be soft you have to be gentle to be able to actually move forward and get the upper hand. Right. If that makes the, any sense. The agility, the flexibility. Yeah. There was that wonderful Bruce Lee quote, um, which uh, it basically goes like this. He was asked, apparently, he was asked, what's the best form of self-defense? Mm. Uh, and uh, his response was, the best way to defend yourself is when the punch arrives, be somewhere else. Yeah. Run away, just run away. And all you have to do is if there's somebody after you and there's somebody with you, just run faster than them. When you're growing things, um, there must surely be favorites. Yes. There's got to be, uh, is it, is it the, the, the hard part of the gardening, the landscaping, the rocks, that sort of thing? Is it a particular plant? It's an interesting thing that so many people will say, come to my place. I mean, I've got a very small garden in mean, mm -hmm. Parkas. It's really, really tiny. Um, and they'll go, I thought, you know, as a designer that you would have this incredibly designed garden. And they always think about hard landscaping, mm. whereas I love plants. So my garden has been set up in such a way that I don't have to do any maintenance in my garden. Basically, things get planted. If they work, they get to stay. If they die, well, they're not supposed to be there. That's why I go for plants generally, which are more hardy. That obviously, going for plants that grow in your own area are the way to go. But so many breeders are now taking things like Fainbos from the Western Cape and breeding them so that they can handle all of the conditions that we have up in Gauteng, for instance, on the High Felt, because it's not their natural place to be. But for me, there is nothing, and nor shall there ever be anything so exalted on the face of God's great earth. And I was about to go into the Muffin Man, but it's not, it's the Agapanthus. 
And as Alan Titchmarsh, who's one of the great English gardeners and TV gardeners, says, it's sex on stalks. They are <laughs> the absolute pinnacle of plants as far as I'm concerned. And I know people sit there and go, oh, but they're so common. Everybody's got them. And I'm like, yeah, because they fill that gap. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to fuss and frittle with them. You just leave them and they do their own thing. I want to do a book about the most incredible trees and plants in specific areas in South Africa. Wouldn't There's something... Cool? Absolutely. Uh, uh, there's a legend I know from, from Baobabs, yes. um, which is that they can move. There's an idea that, that they walk. I would be very frightened if I saw a Baobab walking after me. Well, just think about it, because when Baobabs are young, yeah. no one notices them. Yeah, because so yeah, well, they don't look like Baobabs. At, yeah. the, at the moment when you notice a Baobab, it's suddenly huge, it's been there, and that idea that you didn't notice it, now there's this huge tree there, is that maybe it walked there in the night. It's a wonderful kind of creepy legend. Because those things get like Huge. really big. Mm, mm. And I think that's one thing is that people don't realize when they're looking at the space and they, they fall in love with a plant. I must have that plant, they go. But, you know, you've got to think about what's going to happen in 20 years time. It's mm -hmm. going to like really be huge and you'll have no sun on your house. Yeah. You don't realize how big things get until you actually put it in a small space. It takes up all and the yep. space and yep. now your dog has to do push-ups because there's nowhere to walk and yep. all of that kind of thing. Yeah, up against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of, of trees, of gardening, of interest in nature. Um, now you've told me you've actually written a book. Tell me about the book. Show me the book. Where's the book? Well, the, the book is there. <laughs> and I'll have my handy manservant over here just passing it to me. There we go. Here is my book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see, never, we do these things incredibly it, professionally. It was a thing that I'd, I'd kind of never thought that I'd know enough about gardening to be able to write a book or to come up with a book which is slightly different to all the, the gardening books that you get here in South Africa. But I mean, I am so passionate about it. And I'd been working for Garden and Home as their gardening editor with Connell Oosterbrook. And then we had written so much and we said, let's put a book together. All right, so Connell and myself had written, well, he's, he's a photographer and... We'd done so much over the years, and we said, well, let's, let's just pitch the book. And within three days of pitching the book, they'd come back and said, right, how soon can we have the book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, well, it's already written. So it was a case of actually just um, fine-tuning it and getting the right pictures, which takes forever, finding the right pictures. But it's got all the different kind of styles of garden that you could have in South Africa. So it's not about uh, we're doing a, an indigenous garden. It's like if you want to have a forest garden, what plants you can use, and then there'll be how to plant a tree. And then it'll have something about succulent gardens and what plants would you use and then how to be water wise. So it, there's a little bit of information about each of the styles of the garden and how to achieve that look. Okay, so other than Johannesburg, mm. where you've been based for, for a long, a long time. time, yeah. What is, what's your favorite place? What's your heart place? I mean, everybody always says Cape Town. No, so. two places and unfortunately neither of them in South Africa. Okay. <laughs> well, one is in Mauritius. I love Mauritius. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would happily go back there any time. And Southeast Asia, mainly because I don't like winter. And there's no real place to escape winter in South Africa. Um, KZN, you know, there's, there's, I do go down. I do take that little pilgrimage around about July when things are just too hectically cold and I need a break from cold. Right. Um, fortunately, my parents live down in KZN. Okay. So I was always up and down to the coast and uh, the lower south coast, not the upper coast, right down at the very bottom in the banana country. Oh, okay. Where, what sort of area? Leisure Bay. They were in Leisure Bay. I had property in Palm Beach. So that whole section between, say, Ramsgate or Port Shepson, but mainly Ramsgate, all the way down to Port Edward. I yes. know that area really like the back of my hand. Right. That, we were there a while ago and there's that, um, the nature reserve with that incredible fossilized forest. Yeah, well, there, there's so many things that people don't know about. And in fact, I hadn't been down to the petrified forest for a while. And if you, you've got to go to the, the Wild Coast Sun and you park there and then you walk down the beach. But I think they've now got somebody that you have to go with a guide, although we took no notice. We just walk straight down the beach because that's what we do. We walk the beaches. Mm -hmm. And it is one of those things. You walk past where the petrified forest was because most of it's actually been plundered now, which is sad. And then you walk along the side where there are these weird little caves and you look there and there's a fossil of like a turtle. You can actually That's see amazing. the turtle which has been fossilized. Yeah. And it's really fascinating. So 
Um, also, this, this just outside Port Edward, sorry, I get so excited about this, because people don't know about it, the smallest desert in the world, and it is actually a specific site. It's been named as the smallest desert, the I've, Red Desert. That's, sorry, what was it again? The Red Desert. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. It's tiny, it's only 17 hectares. I mean, it's like, but it looks like you're standing in the Grand Canyon with all of these weird shapes, and it's, it's just this perfect little desert right next to the sea in the middle of all of the subtropical foliage. It's bizarre. I have heard of it, but I've never actually gone there. That, ah. uh, because it's, yeah, it's only the size of a few rugby fields. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. And people have, have, have come up with the weirdest ideas of how it a arrived. A spaceship landed. Yes. 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 But this is nonsense. <laughs> they don't know why. But um, it is a really fascinating place to actually just go and visit. And I found out about it, obviously, because my father was always walking. He was a big walker, a mm. hiking club down there. And he took us to see it. But then I saw, because I geocache as well. I'm mm -hmm. an like ardent geocacher. It's treasure hunting with a GPS. So that's right up my street. It is. I've, and I've... it is, that is a earth catch. So you have to okay. actually go there and then you answer all these questions. He gives you the story behind it. And then you answer the questions and you take a photograph of yourself there with your GPS to say that you were there. Right. Yeah. It, it ties in because I found this my passion is some kind of finding old books. Mm. And I found this book which um, basically took a legend from the 1920s, which is about the monster of Margate. I don't know now, about this. How weird is this? Because Margate is, is just up the, yes. up the coast from there. And apparently in the 1920s, people noticed a whale just past the breakers mm -hmm. and this whale was thrashing around and it looked like it was fighting with something the kraken and something washed up and this thing was the size of a whale mm -hmm. but had no blood was white and seemed like it had hair or little tentacles and people at that point um tried to to drag it past the high water mark Mm -hmm. uh, they inspanned oxen, teams of oxen, but nothing was strong enough to drag this creature, this dead creature. It was probably a giant jellyfish. And then, <laughs> on the next extra high tide, it was, it was washed gone. away and never seen again. Uh, it was a giant tentacle squid. Or, 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 the aliens landed at the Red <laughs> Desert. <laughs> the Red Desert, okay. <laughs> okay. No. <I'll laughs> Well, well, okay. No, I, I understand this. There, there's so much history down there as well. My mm, father mm. would be, he'd go walking all the beaches. I mean, he walked, I think, almost the entire kind of coastline of South Africa on his walks. And he put together a little thing with all the pottery that he'd picked up, which was washed up onto the shore, the blue and yes. white pottery off of the boats that had sunk. Yes. So there's like, there is a wreck down there that you can go and visit. And I mean, I found all of these things out just from geocaching. And that's the joy of it. Mm. Um, you know, people often say uh, that you don't need, let me put it this way, you don't need a qualification to find out about stuff. No, you, you just can have to read. To walk. And walk. <laughs> Sorry. I live up to my surname, I'm Indeed. a walker. Yes, <laughs> um, because there are old Portuguese wrecks there, yeah. the, the, um, the river, Mtamvuna. Um, mm, mm. Mtamvuna River Gorge. Oh, that's also the most amazing place to walk. And if you go and you walk there, you'll see all of those little names on the trees that were put there by my dad. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I want to invite you because I know that that you were a racing driver. Yes. And as long as you're prepared to treat her gently, I'd like to invite you to take a spin in the Toyota Corona, which is my my favorite car in the world. Right, so there's a bit of a trick to this one. Yeah. Well, you start it, then the sign. Has it got a choke and everything? No, it's an automatic choke. Everything's okay. done. It's fine. Should go beautifully. Um, the brakes are... Uh, give it some distance. <laughs> <laughs> I want to invite you. No one else since I bought this car has... I've never let anybody else drive it. I promise I'll be gentle. Melanie Walker, I'm inviting you to drive this magnificent Toyota Corona. And then I'll let you drive the ex Ermintrude. How's that? I want to hear about why she's ex Ermintrude. We'll tell you why. Um, but, I mean, I would still rather have an old car, to be honest. 
Yeah. It's like airline safety belts. <laughs> <laughs> Insert the flat metal tip. Yes. And so you hear a loud click sound. What makes you think I was an air hostess? You were not an air I hostess. Was a, I was a flying mattress. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't a mattress, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> chips and drinks. Uh, coffee, tea or me. <laughs> okay. No, I flew on air buses or scare buses as we used to call them. Yes. There's also, that you, uh, then I did a, a little while on 737s. And they call them fluffies. Stop. One, two, three, four, and uh, your uh, indicators on your right. Okay, I'm going to drive like a granny. Please do. Because my child told me I'm become a bully now. Uh, what's a bully? I'm like, I remember. Who's your bully? That was that was the old the old days. It was my old bully. Yeah, was, that like was your, bully. your dad was your old bully. And what what was the name for your mom? I don't know. Like that. Um, my old lady. Old lady. Yeah. Yeah. My old, my old lady and my old lady. No, my child turned around because I bought a pair of tracksuit pants for the first time in my life. I've never had a pair of tracksuit pants. So I bought some and I'm wearing them. She says, no, man, look at you. You're wearing comfortable shoes and tracksuit pants. You look like a bully. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, seriously, you can't tell me that. Which way are we going? We're going to take Oh, I see what you mean about the brakes. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, I'm going very slowly. There we go. So... This is my classic car. It's beautiful. I love this. I would happily drive this around South Africa. You don't have to go fast. Mm. Why do you want to go fast? You can't see things when you're whizzing past at speed. What <laughs> happened to the power steering? That's one well, thing about cars now. I, I, I would prefer power steering and cup holders. Air conditioning. Aircon. Heater. Aircon. <laughs> now this one's, got, this one's got a heater whether you like it or not. As soon yeah. as the engine heats up, you've got a heater. Same thing with my ex Ermintrude. Tell me about Ermintrude, please. How does it, uh, why Ermintrude? Well, I originally went and bought myself a little BMW 2002 Ti, which I loved. I'd always wanted one. I'd always been in love with the car. And when I found one, I could buy it. I was the happiest person in the world. Mm -hmm. And then it got stolen outside the SABC in broad daylight by somebody. So I was right. really very depressed. So I went looking for another one. And then I saw this, BM 1800 Neuer Klasse, I, knew, I didn't know about that mark at all, I only know about the 2002s. Right. So I went to go and have a look at it, it was four door and I was just like, oh no, it's not what I really want. But then the price was so good and the car was in such lovely condition. The lines on, on oh. those, that sort of original medium sized BMW, yeah. magnificent. But I never really appreciated her and it was the owners that had her before me that called her Ermintrude. So I said, well, okay, well, I'm not, you can't go and just suddenly change something's name. Bad but luck. Yeah, but I call it the ex Ermintrude because it's now my car, so I don't, I, just so people know, I didn't change, choose that name. So okay. When I was a teenager, my boyfriend then, he had a, a Combi um, panel, nice. it was a half panel van. Her name was Madame Claude. <laughs> and um, it had a big double bed in the back, wood paneling, veneer wood paneling, right. sheepskin. We used to travel around the country in that car. Then we put a Porsche engine into it. <laughs> the one time, however, when we were coming back from Cape Town, the engine fell out of the engine compartment onto the road just outside Robertson. So we managed to find a mechanic who could help us like put it back together. We used a broomstick. It took us four days, but we hitched home with the combi. You hitched home with the combi? We hitched all the way to Johannesburg from Robinson, Robertson back to Johannesburg into the Amazing. driveway. We hitched Amazing. every now and then the car would start going and we'd like get all excited put the music on and go but then i mean we would we'd find little karoo hotels and they still had the fire escapes in those communal bathrooms so we'd run up the stairs and go and have a shower and the guy calling you for dinner with a ding 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 ding. yeah ding. one of those hotels but we was like living in the combi the three of us it was quite a thing i mean i was 17. yeah coming back four day trip back from cape town it was great Tell us a little bit about how you got into motor racing. Because I like cars. Mm -hmm. And I was friends with Lupini's, Michele Lupini, who raced cars at the time. And he said, well, come and do some um, hill climbs. And he took me under his wing and I went and I did all the hill climbs. And the next thing, because I was doing treasure hunt, I had like quite a nice high profile. And all the sponsors just came on board and said, right, we're going to give you a car. We're going to give you everything. And I just got all the sponsorship in the world, which really annoyed all the men. Because I was the only girl who was racing in that time. 
So I raced for a, a Volkswagen GTI. Okay. Um, I was sponsored by um, Firestone, Firehawks, Hawkeye, that's where I got my nickname from. Um, and I just really loved speed. So I did every single course known to man, spent hours on the track with some of the best teachers in the world. And then I loved it, but then, you know, all good things come to an end. Suddenly something happens and you get a fright and you think, hang on a second, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I have a, still got a better track record than a lot of other racing drivers because I never crashed one of my cars. Okay. okay. And I never came worse than third. Wow. And there, there, there were no, this was not a segregated men, women. This was racing everybody in the same race. Yep. Of course. Anything a man can do, a woman can do better. And in high heels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then you moved, you moved to bikes. Yeah. Then I, I, was, I liked bikes a lot. And then also, once again, should we go down? Yes. Let's turn left. Um, once again, because I'm a girl. I mean, I bought my Hardy, and so I had a Hardy, an, an old XLH um, thousand which I could just get my toes onto the floor. So if there happened to be a <laughs> bit of a dip in the road, I couldn't hold the bike up, <laughs> which was really ridiculous. What do you feel, what makes classic cars unique? Say something nice about my Toyota. What makes classic oh, cars unique? I, the ability just to relax into it, to not feel like you need to go speeding somewhere fast. The simplicity of the controls. They feel different. They feel, you get strong arms driving them, yeah. that's for sure. They smell different, the old... Um... The smell is just the best, <laughs> oh, the old vinyl and the rubber and, you know, the, the, it's, you know, you can feel the seats and you sit in cars, modern cars these days, yeah, they're nice, they're comfortable and whatever. This is actually more comfortable, my back feels fantastic. <laughs> Doesn't yours? Yeah, I you love driving. Sense because I'm driving. No, I'm completely but relaxed. Yeah. Here. Yes. I'm completely relaxed. It's been an absolute pleasure to sit in the passenger seat and, and be and driven around yes. by a blonde chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> so as we arrive, uh, Melanie, thank you very much. It's thank you for this. Such a pleasure and I really have enjoyed being able to chat to you. And thank you for letting me play with your baby. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>